There we go. Okay, so today what we've been talking about in the lecture is how do you find sites? Um, and this is a question which we've been dealing with ever since archaeology started, <clears throat> but it's increased importance as we've been doing more and more heritage management work and environmental impacts assessment. Remember last time I was talking about how a great number of archaeologists, in fact, the majority, don't actually work in academia. They're employed uh, in public institutions or they're also um, doing work for cultural resource management firms. So in that case, what you're doing is you're doing things like looking over an area where someone's going to build a, a new house or they're going to put a big pipeline through and trying to get a sense of what's there, uh, what archaeology is present, and create what they talk about as environmental impact assessment. Uh, since this started uh, with legislation in the 1960s and 70s, of course, this meant that the need for doing archaeological site surveying to see where sites are and where they're not uh, has increased tremendously. So this has become a big deal and a big part of what archaeologists do. Fortunately, since the 1990s, there's been a lot of progress been made with GPS and GIS integration and cheaper, better remote sensing um, and things like Google Earth, which I hope you've all had a chance to download and play with a little bit. There's also been organization take place. You can join the International Society for Archaeological Prospectation, Prospection, uh, and there's journals out there uh, which regularly feature articles. You've also probably had a chance to look at some of the YouTube videos, which I think have got some really cool uh, new tech uh, things to show you. Okay, so something to think about with sites and what makes them harder or easier to find are the, the characteristics of salience, visibility, accessibility, vulnerability. Um, let's think about salience. Salience is really about how intrinsically visible, noticeable a kind of a site is. So you think about the difference between something like a Maya temple, big pyramid, should be able to see it for miles. And this little scatter of a few stone tools in the ground, that is not going to be very visible from any great distance. And even if you don't have a lot of vegetation in the way, even if it's on bare ground, you won't really see that lithic scatter until you're within a, a few feet of it in most cases. So the salience of that Maya temple and that lithic scatter are really different. One is much more salient than the other. And then there's visibility. That sounds like the same thing, but it doesn't. This brings in the issues of what are the environmental conditions. You know, if you have a dense jungle, how salient is that Maya temple? We'll see example of not being salient, salient at all. And also, how are you looking? What's your method of perception? Are you using your eyes on ground level? Are you looking down from a drone using visible light spectrum? Are you using infrared? Are you using LIDAR? As we'll see, these are all different ways of looking at the ground surface, finding sites, which can produce very dr dramatic differences in site visibility. Then there's some things to think about as you're thinking about trying to, to understand how easy or difficult it's going to be to actually visit sites. Um, accessibility is a big one. Are there roads nearby? Are you going to be hiking in? Do you need a helicopter? Do you need a boat? It's also really quick to get to the question, okay, whose land are you going to be walking over if you're actually going there? So this is the issue of permits and stakeholders. And again, as we'll see, this is all about working stages from working first to the desktop and then finally getting out to the field. And finally, there's the issue of vulnerability. How in danger are sites to different kinds of things, sea level rise, erosion, glacial movements? These are all issues, especially today, we're seeing rapid climate change, which have a lot to do with both the damage to sites, but also your ability to see them. So some kinds of erosion will make a site visible will previously be totally hidden. So here's some examples of the site visibility. Yeah, there's a Maya temple in that picture, believe it or not. See this guy standing there? That's the top of the pyramid. And as you can see, you can see a situation where the vegetation is so dense that the actual visibility of what should be a very salient structure is just about zero. It's really hard to see it unless you're right stumbling up against it. Here's a couple other Mayan archaeologists who are looking at a stela carved stone. And again, I think you can see that it's not very visible from any great distance. There's also an issue about thinking about seasonality too. You know, vegetation grows and different seasons allow you to see the ground at better times than others. Uh, and of course, much archaeology is in places where agriculture is taking place. 
And so you're often working with farmers, you're often trying to get permission to walk across their fields. So looking at these three photos, um, all maize agriculture, what's the best time to do surveying to walk across this field to try to find some archaeology, look at differences in soil colors, maybe some artifacts from the surface? Yeah, I think you got that already. Right here, freshly plowed field, especially after rain, which will wash the dirt off of the artifacts leaves on the surface, this is when you have your maximum visibility. This is when you're going to be actually able to see the ground, and you're also going to be able to see artifacts that have been brought up to the surface by this plowing. And here's early spring, where the crops are just coming in. It's not as good, but at least there's, there's some chance of seeing the ground. And here's your cornfield with the corn, you know, two meters tall. And even if you're right in there, you can't see more than a few feet in that direction. Also, think about from a farmer's standpoint about whether or not they're going to really want you walking through their cornfield in a, in a line of people. And I can guarantee you that by the time it gets to this stage, they will not want you there. So this is a question then of seasonality affecting visibility and affecting your ability um, to do field walking archaeology. This is also an issue for archaeologists who are academics because part of the problem with our academic teaching schedule is that sometimes the times that we're here in class, virtual or live, uh, will be actually the best time to be out in the field. So you're looking at this field that's probably being plowed in North America in late winter, and that's when we're supposed to be indoors teaching you folks. So the problem then is often that by the time we're out, it's high corn season. So there's one thing to think about is you're thinking about designing an archaeological survey is the seasonality, the kind of agriculture is taking place, um, how visible are your sites going to be at different times of the year? Okay, uh, this is sort of a picture from Greenland where we're pushing the envelope a bit. Uh, this is a, uh, a bunch of brave surveyors out in April, um, and we should have left stuff out in late May. Um, we were trying to get people out uh, and do as much as we could in the time period available, and you can see it's kind of hard to do much archaeology if it's covered with snow. Okay, you can also see a situation where different kinds of land surfaces give you very different visibility of different kinds of archaeological sites. Here's two pictures from Iceland, where in much of the country you have a thick sod cover, not a lot of trees, but you know, really thick sod covering pretty much everything. In this lower picture, you can see there's our faithful land rover. You may just be able to make out here that there's some humps and bumps, you know, sort of greener patches. This is actually a house run from the medieval period. Uh, again, not very visible unless you know just exactly what you're looking for. And again, not very visible from any great distance. And there's nothing to pick up on the surface. All the artifacts that might be there are down beneath that sod. And here's a, a boundary wall, much more visible. There's George Hambright, my colleague, walking on it. And you can see there, again, this is a fairly visible uh, feature. Um, but again, it's it's covered by sod. Erosion, however, uh, can strip away the sod and a lot of dirt and really enhance visibility. This is also Iceland. This is actually just uh, about 30 kilometers inland from that last picture. And here you're seeing a really different landscape. Uh, wind erosion, deflation, has stripped off the soil. You can see just in the background here, just a few patches of sod hang on here in this braided glacial river. And so what you're looking at here, this pile of rocks you're looking at here, you can see it's actually a perimeter of rocks. And this is the remains of a largely turf building with some stones in it that is completely eroded away. On the surface, well, there's a cow bone sitting right out on the surface. Invisible, easy to see, hard to miss. So you can walk around the site, you can see objects on the surface. Um, this is when we visited uh, about 10 years ago now. Um, 20 years before we got there, uh, a band of travelers happened to get there just as a large pile of silver was eroding out. So they were visible, visibly able to uh, get this treasure, which they very correctly turned into the National Museum of Iceland. So we're seeing here is that high visibility can be produced by erosion that is in the process of destroying the site. As you can see, that, that cow bone, Viking Age cow bone, is not going to last much longer. It's all falling apart, it's going to be pieces. So because it's been exposed on the surface, it's once good conditions of organic preservation just going to pieces and it's, it's falling apart. So again and again, the kinds of feature, the kinds of climatic uh, and erosion situations that reveal sites often have a tendency to destroy them. So in some parts of the world where you have lots of archaeology on the surface, it's because you have 
not much sod and lots of erosion taking place. So this includes archaeology hitting places like the American Southwest, parts of coastal South America, places like Egypt, much of Mesopotamia. Again, these are places where there's a lot of archaeology on the surface, but that's because of ongoing erosion. So erosion and vulnerability again, this is again Iceland. This is a, uh, a site on the coast of Iceland. I think what you can see is just jumping out at you, all those white specks are bones. Um, so most of the white specks you're seeing there are mammal bones, or probably sheep bones mostly. Uh, but in among them, if you zoom in on this, uh, there's just tons of fish bones. See, so it's a really rich layer running along here for quite some distance. The stones you see here are partly natural. Here's beach co cobbles here being eroded out, but these have been piled up into walls. So you're actually seeing a cross section through what turns out to be a big fishing station from the 15th century, the medieval period. So again, the erosion which is taking place here is increasing the visibility of a site as it's being destroyed. Now, climate change isn't the only thing that's working on disturbing sites. Um, these are wombats, wombat burrow. Um, it's from a picture from Australia. Uh, I thought wombats were kind of cute, so I put them up here. But actually, lots of animals make burrows. In doing so, what they're doing is they're often reversing stratigraphy. They're digging down and going through layers of archaeology, and they're bringing up to the surface all kinds of things which are buried quite deeply. So you see on the surface, you see stone tools, you see coins all mixed up together. They're not in the original position. They're not in situ, but they're on the surface. You can see them. So, you know, are wombats your friends or not? Well, to some extent, they're your friends because they make visible archaeology beneath you. You probably would not see if you're just walking over it. So they increase the visibility of site, but at the same time, they're messing up stratigraphy. So bioturbation, the process of mixing up the soil from anything living, whether it's animals, um, earthworms, crayfish, mammals, all dig, shift the soil, um, or plants, trees, this kind of thing. Um, these all change the archaeology. They mess things up the stratigraphy. Uh, they're generally not our friends, but they do sometimes raise the visibility of sites if you're walking around looking for them. Okay, so one of the things to think about as you're putting together a survey project is what are your objectives? What, what are you trying to do here with this problem project of finding sites? Are you going to try to find all the sites? Well, good luck with that, because that's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, some sites will just be deeply buried. Even if you walk right over them repeatedly, you won't see them. Are you going to find all the big, visible, accessible, salient sites? All the pyramids that happen near a road, so you can see them from the window of your car. Well, okay, that's one kind of survey, but I think you can see that's not going to answer the questions which most people are going to ask you to answer if you're doing something like uh, a cultural resource management assessment of what happens when you put a road through here. So are you going to find a representative sample of sites? And that's much closer to what people are going to want you to do in your assignment of doing CRM work, cultural resource management work. And that turns out to be a little tricky as well. You got to put together some kind of a survey strategy where you find both the pyramids, you know, things you can see from miles away, and the scatters of flint, the things you only see from up close. So how many flint scatters relative to how many pyramids? You suspect probably a lot more flint scatters, but how to prove that? Then the other question is, how about the vulnerable sites? This may be part of what you're tasked to do, is find the sites that look as though they might be in danger from either construction or from natural forces. So again, this is a question you're targeting on areas that are showing vulnerability. Finding sites in relation to each other, that's another one. Uh, are these connected to each other? Are they these big sites and small sites part of the same settlement system? And placing sites in landscape, what kinds of sites are always next to particular landscape features? You know, which ones are next to the streams? Which ones are near passes? Which ones are near trails? Which are right next to good agricultural land? Those are the kinds of questions you should be thinking about. Then, of course, there's the issue of finding sites cheaply, rapidly, over a wide area. And the old joke, of course, is, you know, pick two of these and I'll get it right, because this is a tough thing to combine. Okay, this also leads you to survey styles, which you also think of as phases of survey. As you'll see again and again in archaeology, you know, you're taking on these big complicated problems, and the way to address them is to break them into stages. You know, you're always studying from a situation you don't know very much at all, and you're gradually getting more and more information layered on until you begin to know quite a bit about a site or an area 
you're trying to find out about. So in survey styles, we start with what people talk about as desktop survey. This is a pre-field assembly of information. You know, everything you could find out about this region. Uh, you start with prior work. Almost no part of the world has had zero archaeology done it before. So your job is to go ahead and find out what's happened. Both looking at published papers, but also very frequently going to archives and finding all the unpublished reports that wound up in, in county histories or in local archaeology offices uh, and try to track those down. There's also a case of trying to find old photographs and then remote sensing information. And as you're doing that, you're also trying to gather logistic information. You know, how much does gas cost in this area? Um, you know, how secure is it to leave tools out on a site? You know, those are some issues to be thinking about as you're working with this. And of course, one of the things you're doing in this desktop survey period is you're talking to people. Ideally, you're talking to people who've had work in, work in this area before. You're making contact with other archaeologists or other people who do landscape work in the region and find out what they know. And also try to find out from them who are knowledgeable people in the area that you can talk to if you go there. Okay, then there's what people have talked about as the car window survey. Uh, it's a bit of a joke is, you know, you're surveying out the window of your car as you're driving around. What we're talking about here is a very low intensity survey. Um, it's cheap and it's fast, but it's quite limited. You're going to tend to see the pyramids and miss all the scatters. If you think about it in terms of phased approach, though, this is a logical thing you might do after you complete your desktop and you've got all the information you think you can get together without going there. So if it's a place you can visit, go ahead and visit. You know, just go with yourself and maybe one or two friends. Um, don't spend a lot of money, don't spend a lot of time, but go around and confirm the sorts of things that you think you saw on Google Earth on the ground. Get what they call ground truth. And also while you're there, talk to people. You know, find out who owns the land, find out who are stakeholders, find out who are knowledgeable people may know a lot about the archaeology, uh, even if they're not professionals. Um, so this is a case where you can go and learn quite a lot uh, as part of a phased approach without spending a whole lot of money. So this is just a couple of people, uh, not a full crew. So then the thing is thinking about, okay, now we're going to have to come up with a project that's for more systematic sampling. The car window survey, you're just driving around looking at things, it's not very structured. Uh, systematic sampling is very different. This is where you're trying to find sites in a particular area in the same proportion that they actually use us in the ground. Again, that's tough. So you're putting in different survey patterns, quadrats and transects, talk about it in a minute, random versus purposes survey, come back to that too. And then you should pump up your intensity. Um, pedestrian survey, people actually walking across the landscape, looking down at the ground, recording objects, picking some of them up. Um, big issues here about how many crew, how far apart, um, this is where the salience and visibility issues are really issue. If you're walking people across a highly eroded landscape with lots of artifacts on the surface, that's one visibility issue. If we're talking about going through a rainforest where there could be a, a Maya temple 10 feet away, you wouldn't see it, that's another issue by a long shot. Then there's a question, of course, about trying to raise visibility of buried sites by disturbing ground, by putting in cores, test pits, trial trenches, um, different sizes of intrusions. And here, what you're always having to balance out is what are we learning about the site versus how much damage we're doing to the site by making these holes. So that's something to we'll come back to, but that's an ongoing issue as you're going from survey towards excavation. You know, survey is trying to find many sites, excavations, focusing on a limited number of sites and digging them up. And then, of course, in the modern world, you have all sorts of issues of being able to look for sites in, in a non-invasive, non-destructive fashion using geophysics, phosphates, ground penetrating radar. We'll talk a bit about those today too. Okay, but let's, <coughs> excuse me, let's have a look at survey styles. This has come about again, as people increasingly are having to answer questions like what will happen if we put a road through here? What are we gonna find? You know, if we're, if we're thinking about budgeting. So you have then um, the kind of survey which people used to do back in the old days down the bottom, an unsystematic survey, which is probably better known as the judgmental survey. This is where somebody is wandering along here. She's an archeologist and she's looking along this area here. And you can see what she's doing. So there's a watercourse and trees, there's a road going through here. 
There's a higher elevations over here, it's flat over there. Her experience has been in previous years of working in this part of the world that the archaeology is going to be most visible weathering out along the watercourse. So if she's interested in finding some like Paleolithic archaeology, bison kill or something, this is where she's going to see it. It's going to be eroding out along the watercourse. She's going to spend a bunch of time walking along that watercourse, keeping an eye out what's there. Also, areas that have water and that vegetation are going to draw settlement in multiple time periods. So she's going to spend a bunch of time checking out around this watercourse. And then you can see, because she's not just walking, she's got a vehicle, uh, the road really makes it easier for her to survey around this area. Sorry, come back one. So on the other hand, you have some big areas which she hasn't looked at. You know, areas which the assumption has been there's no archaeology visible out there or there's no archaeology at all because we've never looked there and we never found any. And I think you see the problem with that. Um, are you sure there's no archaeology out there because you haven't looked? Now, the other option is to do what they call systematic survey, where what you're doing is you're walking these long lines called transects across the same landscape. And you're putting all this effort into walking across these. And you can see it's a very different pattern. Uh, instead of allocating your time and resources to places you're pretty sure you're going to find archaeology, um, you're looking both in areas where you probably will find archaeology, but also in big areas where you probably won't. But are you sure they're not there? So you can see there's advantage and disadvantage to both of these different styles of doing archaeological survey. Systematic is ensuring that you're going to look in places where you wouldn't normally look but it may not necessarily be the most efficient way of finding sites, which is a different issue. Okay, so here we're looking at some quadrats uh, and attempt to sample by uh, random numbers. And this is an attempt to try to get a statistically valid sample of the sites in your area, which is challenging. Uh, the problem about using random numbers to locate sites or places you're going to put your effort in is you can wind up with a big chunk, which there's, you know, the numbers didn't come up. So you're not actually looking there. Another strategy is to grid the sample in your area off and to make sure that within these grids, the sample in area, in this case, the square quadrat, will appear. So this means you get a better coverage over the area. So quadrats are the squares that you're looking in. A transect is this long pathway that you're walking across the landscape. So quadrats and transects are just different ways of focusing your archaeological survey attention on different pieces of land. So here you can see what's happened when somebody has gone ahead and followed up a quadrat approach uh, with excavation, the sampling uh, through excavation. And what we wind up getting is this discontinu discontinuous pattern of test pits across the landscape. And you can see it found some archaeology. See, there's a, a partially empty pit here. You can see some differences in soil color. It looks like they got some. So stones coming up here, uh, but it's also difficult to tell the relationship between the stain you see over here, the one over there. Um, if you could open up this whole area, you'd probably see it. So the problem about doing survey and sampling this way um, is you may get a statistically valid sample across an area, but it may not necessarily be the best way to actually see the archaeology. Uh, and in fact, it may wind up damaging the site in ways that will be hard to, hard to fix later. Okay, so here's a crew lined up doing transect survey. Again, the long line. And this is a pretty typical setup. Uh, this is the UK. They're, everybody's wearing their, their bright yellow health and safety vest. And you can see they're actually out there at the right time of the year. This is a freshly plowed field. Uh, they're going to go out there and they're looking very closely down at their, their feet. Now, this is what archaeologists look like in the field. We spend a lot of time looking down. Um, and you can see they're spaced pretty closely together. So this team is going to walk back and forth across this field once they've covered, and they're going to find all the artifacts that are visible on the surface. That's a pretty high intensity survey. You know, they're going to find most of the archaeology that there is to see uh, on that surface. But again, there's a trade off between survey intensity, you know, in this case, how many people and how closely spaced are they, versus the area you have to cover. You know, because you're always limited in time. And in money, you know, the resources that you know, come together, you know, money buys time. Um, so if you're a bigger area and you have a smaller crew, you know, what, what to do? And again, there isn't one single right answer to that. But here's some things to think about. 
and this other landscape down here. For one thing, you can see this is not a plowed field. This is a much more rugged landscape. It's not farming going on here. So the soil isn't conveniently turned over for you <coughs> and it's not flat. So more challenging. So the question then is how far apart do you space your crew as they're walking down their transect lines? And here it says 25 to 30 meters, meters about a yard. And then what's the area that they're actually gonna be scanning as they're walking along here? And again, that's the question, what can you actually see as you're you know, walking down this, this line? And they're thinking, you've got one and a half meters of, of view shed there. That means that there's a big area in between these transects, which actually nobody's looking at. Uh, and of course, you can see that that's a much lower intensity survey than this one. This survey has got a very good chance of taking just about everything in the area. This one is better than nothing by a long shot, but you can see, you can see it will not produce the same kinds of results. So how far apart, what kind of visibility you have, uh, plowed field versus jungle. You know, these are all issues that people have to cope with in the real world as they're trying to put together a survey. And then there's a question about surface collection. You pick up stuff as you, you see it. Uh, and some site survey strategies, yes, you do. You know, anything you see on the surface, you pick it up, you bag it, you locate it. And this, of course, means that you're taking it off the site. So that does mean then that you actually are to some extent damaged in the site. You remember, every time you disturb a site through collection or excavation, you're damaging. You're damaging if you're a looter, but you're also damaging if you're an archaeologist. And again, what's the difference in archaeologist and looter? Context, location, taking the notes. So one question then is if you're doing a surface collection, it means you have to be able to locate your finds in space. You need to be able to record where they come from. So you put them in bags, you save them, you know where they come from, you can relocate them on a map with some level of precision. Maybe not a huge level, not down to the centimeter, but at least, you know, to within a, a few meters. The people over here are working in the Mediterranean zone and they're crossing a field which has been fallowed and they're collecting potsherds and see they're going to bag there. Piece of broken pottery. You see what they've done here is they're working out from around posts. These posts have been sighted in with surveying instruments so they know where the post is. And they look like they're spaced about five meters apart. And so what people are doing is they're going out from around those posts and they're collecting all the pottery they can see on the surface there and putting them back this mark, post one, post two, post three. So that means that within about a 10 meter radius there, um, you're collecting those potsherds. So you know where they come from within that field to plus or minus about 10 meters, which may be good enough if in fact what you're looking at is a field can plow regularly and the things on the surface have been moved around a bit. See the arrowhead there showing up? Again, what do you do with that? Do you put it back in the ground where you found it? So you have a no collection survey and hope that somebody else will find it later when you come back. Um, do you photo it, leave it in place? Do you photo it and take it with you? So this is a question which is really, again, about time and also about the rules of your survey. Now, some projects have no collection policies. You don't collect anything. You don't damage the site by taking things. The problem with that, of course, is, is you know you have nothing to look at when you get out of the field except photos. And it's hard sometimes to do the typologies and the study of the form of the object without the object itself. If you have bags full of potsherds that come home from the field, you have a lot to do in the evening in the lab and you got some, some stuff you got out of it. So there's a balance here. There are sites that have been surface collected so many times there's not a whole lot left of them. So it is possible to surface collect the site to death um, so there's, a, there's points in both directions here. But one thing that has just saved so much of our time and effort is the development of GPS receivers like these. This kind of a museum of different kinds of GPS receivers. And I realized when I looked at this picture, I think we've owned just about every single one of them on here. Uh, archaeologists tended to be early adopters of the clunky early ones down here, 1994. And the snazzier ones, well, getting more modern. And then, of course, your phone now has GPS location, uh, which is really pretty accurate. It's usually down to about a meter, a meter and a half in any given direction. Pretty good. In the past, before they had GPS like this, we would have to try to use a compass to locate ourselves in landscape. Um, someday, if you want, I will show you how to do that. Um, but it's inaccurate. It's slow. Ugh. The old days suck. The new days are better. GPS allows you to locate objects in space using satellite positioning, um, as the name implies, 
And as you know, you can be a whole lot more accurate about where things are. And today, so much of our lives rotate around the ability to locate ourselves and other people very precisely in space, whether you're trying to figure out the, the nearest McDonald's or you're trying to blow up a wedding party with a drone, you know, same thing. Well, not really, but you get the point here. Now, a big thing that happened in the Clinton administration, and thank Bill Clinton for this, um, is that they removed, the U.S. removed the restrictions on the precision with which GPSs, non-military GPSs, could locate things in space. Uh, still to this day, most of the GPS satellites from space are American, uh, and they're military primarily in their mission, and they're being used for other stuff. Um, it's a freebie. Uh, and earlier, they didn't want to have civilians being able to locate with, to finer than 10 meters in a good direction because they didn't want somebody to go to a missile silo in North Dakota and be able to locate precisely the, uh, the entrance to it. So thank Clinton. Uh, now they took the dividend off. And as a result, uh, you can get uh, quite good accuracy in most parts of the world at most times a day. Why the qualification? It depends on how many satellites are above you at the same time. So in our area, in the New York City area, boy, you get good location all the time. If you're in northern Alaska, not so much. So it, again, it's not equally spread across the whole world. But at the moment, we have a dense satellite network now, and you can locate yourself pretty, pretty well. So this actually has transformed our ability to locate ourselves and things quickly in space and push a button and got the answer. So when we're doing site surveying on the island of Barbuda and the Caribbean uh, a few years ago, we were able to pick up individual stone tools, GPS location, write it on the tag, and you've got the thing located to within a, a meter or so, which is, again, pretty good for these standards. So the handheld GPS now built into your phone uh, has been a godsend for archaeologists. Now, to get one up from that, you need to have a mapping grade or centimeter scale, sub-centimeter scale accuracy GPS receiver. Um, and to do that, you need to have a better antenna than is present on your phone. So what you're seeing here is a slightly older version of a, a high resolution mapping grade GPS. Here's two nice people. Uh, they are getting ready to have this person go out and locate sites, locate objects across this field. So set up here, you can see this little mushroom thing, that little mushroom thing. Those are GPS receivers and there's a data logger you can see attached here. So what this person's gonna do is gonna go out and put this pole onto location of sites, coins, anything they can find out there. And the distance between these two receivers allows a more accurate calculation of exactly where you are. Now, the more modern versions of these you can buy today uh, often just use one receiver uh, and they're, they're lighter, easier to work with, but this is a uh, slightly older version. Now, your phone, well, you know how much they cost. Uh, a good high-end handheld GPS receiver you probably get for $500 or less. These things still go for between $20,000 and $40,000 a pop. So they're, they're not cheap, but they can allow you to locate things very, very precisely to putting on the centimeter. Uh, these have been used, for example, to map out in great detail individual tiles uh, on Roman uh, mosaic floors. That gives you an idea of just how accurate you can, you can be with these. And of course, these were also bundled with um, software. So you have a combination of GPS, Global Positioning System Location, with GIS, Geographic Information System software, that allows you very quickly create maps and locate objects in space, and then make calculations about the difference between them. Lots of stuff you do with it. So ArcGIS is one of the uh, industry standards. You can hear, hear some outputs from, from all this. And this again has been a godsend for archeologists because creating maps and locations of sites used to take forever and was very inaccurate in those cases and required us to, to have lots more expertise in using uh, surveyor equipment uh, than I think probably anybody really wanted to get. Um, if you're some bitterness here, it's because I had to learn all of that stuff um, using the optical instruments before GPS, but you don't have to. Uh, so again, the old days sucked, now it's better. Now, of course, also we have drones. And drones, of course, open up even more potentials for locating things in space and also documenting them. Um, on your, your readings in the, uh, um, the videos, uh, there's a couple of good drone videos which will allow you to get lots of information about these. But of course, a drone allows you to have two things come together that archaeologists love to have, which is, say, a top-down view 
of a landscape in a precise location. You put a GPS on these things and they can tell you to where they are within a few centimeters. And they can also use that to map vertically things that they're looking at. So this is, again, a great object. Um, and again, they're, they're getting faster, cheaper, better um, by the day. So again, look at the videos and you'll see much more interesting stuff about drones. I think which again gets us the issue of the cost of site discovery under different circumstances. Um, some landscapes are just easier to find sites on. So the cost of finding a site is much lower. Here's two examples from British Columbia. Uh, this is one in the woods. And to actually find a site where you have thick sod cover like this, you're pretty much doing test pitting. So these people have laid out uh, a grid with string and they are excavating. They're making holes in the ground and this is the way they're finding a site. And of course, this is slow. This is going to take them all day just to do what you've seen there. Uh, and of course, if you're thinking about time and money and paying people salaries, that's a long, slow process. Here, you're seeing instead, this is a, a sandy beach area. This is a big erosion area where lots of archaeology, which was stratified in the sand dune, has blown out and the objects have wound up down here on this floor. You can see here's a line of archaeologists not walking along, but they're sort of crawling along because there's so many finds. So this is a case where site discovery cost is low, there's stuff all over the place, but again, it's rooted out of this area here. So again, salience, visibility, vulnerability, erosion, all coming together in terms of this equation of how much can you find for how much money and how much time. And that's what we're always battling with. Now also, in some places, you can see culture specific markers that you know to look with, look for, um, can really increase your chances of finding particular sites. Um, we're back to Iceland again, and we're looking at a, uh, a beach full of big rocks and seaweed. And if you have really sharp eyes, you can see that in this area here, the rocks can clear the way. And that's not natural. This is people doing this. When you're looking at something called the shtol, and that's where people have cleared the rocks away so you can drag a boat up, a uh, wooden boat up, and make it secure without bashing the timbers too much. Uh, and of course, a shto is time consuming build and it's not fun. So you're, you're moving a lot of rocks. So you wouldn't do that all over the place. And instead you do it only next to a fishing booth. So this highly visible, once you know what to look for, um, channel of rocks is actually pointing to an archeological site. See the lumps there? That's your fishing site. So this is again, uh, early medieval uh, light biking fishing site where they've done this improvement and you're being pointed right to it. So again, if you know what to look for, some of these cultural specific markers can help you find sites you wouldn't necessarily see as easily without them. Yeah, okay, there you go. Okay, so in terms of raising site visibility, um, this is of course the issue of how do you improve your chance of finding a site? And why do they survey using remote sensing, multi-spectrum sensing? This is increasing the way in which people are going. When you get into site localization survey, you know, this is where you're going from the big area, like the whole river valley. Now you're focusing in on the, okay, this, this part of the river, this part of the valley. Um, you're doing site localization. You're trying to see, okay, I'm pretty sure there's an archeological site somewhere um, in this cornfield. Um, just where would it be? This is where you begin to use other techniques like coring and test fitting, soil resistivity, magnetic anomaly, ground penetrating radar. And again, connecting with ex excavation. So let's look at some of these. So looking down from above, getting the landscape focus, um, raising visibility by changing the viewpoint, goes back quite a while in archaeology. Cameras and aircraft go back to the, actually the 19th century, uh, I think by balloons, uh, and they went together early. So after World War, actually during World War One, there's a huge use of aircraft to take pictures from the air for aerial constant purposes. So lots of experience was built up then. And as people were doing this work, they realized they were actually seeing archeology, span you know, the ancient past, as well as the trench lines we're looking at. Um, and actually in 1909, um, Stonehenge was photographed from early right bike lane. Uh, in the 1920s, a British ex-RF officer, JKS St. Joseph, uh, built up a remarkable archive of aerial photography uh, all over Britain uh, flying around. This is one of his photographs you're looking at here. And you can see looking down on the surface, you can see this, this ring hill fort and suggestions of stains in the soil around it. 
made for more archaeology. So his aircraft photograph that he was doing from biplane uh, produced a lot of classic images, and many of them actually show archaeology, which doesn't exist anymore. It's been destroyed by construction or plowing. So J.K. St. St. Joseph's archives are still consulted by archaeology today, even though it's ancient black and white photography. Now, you can see a couple of different things about this from this photograph. This is what's called a, a high angle oblique photograph, which is to say they're up fairly high and they're taking picture obliquely rather than straight down. Vertical photography, looking straight down on the ground, is called photogrammatic photography. And that prior to satellites was how people used to, to map areas um, and get ideas that uh, uh, result in images you can actually measure. And again, this has been, uh, well, Google Earth will do this in 10 seconds, and this took a long time uh, to do otherwise, but this is the difference. So you have a vertical of photogra photogrammetic uh, photographs straight down or the oblique angle, either high or low angle. And again, there's always interpretation issues. And during World Wars I and II, a uh, huge amount of effort was put into developing uh, ways of trying to figure out what you're seeing in the photograph. You know, how big are objects? You know, where the trees are? Uh, how long are the shadows? You know, these were all things that people tried to do. Okay, so you also have air photo coverage maps. That's what it looked like. And then the head, here's another JKS St. Joseph photograph. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of a classic. Um, this is southern Scotland, um, and this has been taken uh, in the early morning with low angle light. See the shadows? See, there's some shadows from trees. You can see the tree shadows here. So you can tell that this is being taken when the sun is low angle. So if you know what, where you are, you can tell whether it's evening or morning. That's yeah, morning. The other thing that's happened is he's taking this picture after light snowfall. So that's why the ground seems to be white in many places. So it's really increasing contrast. So the fact that he's getting this low angle light means that not only are the trees casting shadows, but these ridges in the ground, the archaeology, is also visible through shadows on the, on the ground. And the shadows are being picked up by the white snow. So what you're seeing here then is actually a medieval village site. These aren't actually the houses, but these are the, the gardens around the houses. And then this landscape of these deeply plowed fields with this ridge and fro agriculture going out in all directions. There's a modern village. You can see this is much smaller than the medieval village was in the past. So again, snow blowing the line light, ridge and fro agriculture, and both natural and cultural features are visible here. Cultural features, you can see all the plowing. Natural features, you can see daily drainage channels here. Now, lots of things are going on here. Many different periods are superimposed upon each other in this landscape. And so this rather old photograph from the 1920s um, still has lots of information in it and still very useful. So again, crop marks and low angle light have been used by archaeologists to pick up um, buried features for a long time. We just saw the example of shadow marking. Uh, thinking about soil marking, one of the things that happens um, as archaeology accumulates and soil accumulates on top of it is that the Substrate, the archaeology affects the grass growth on top. <coughs> In many areas, if you have a, a bank and ditch or a depressions cut by humans past, those will hold moisture better than soil around them. So in a drought, the crops will grow higher in those areas. You have negative markings when there's something like a stone wall underneath there. It doesn't hold water very well. So as a result, in a drought, that's going to be a negative feature. Here's what it looks like in practice. A few years ago in Britain, they had a big drought and people were out like crazy with their, their drones and airplanes taking pictures. And here's one of them looking down at a field in Dorsetshire in Southern England. And look at all that stuff coming up. You know, that's all archaeology. Now, these circles are probably Iron Age structures. This rectangular thing here turned out to be a Roman fort. So there's lots of stuff happening here. Here is again, same summer. That outline is a Roman marching fort. You can see it very clearly from above because of the ditches are showing green and then the wall lines are showing uh, more parched. So crop marks great. Satellite images go back quite a long time. Early Landsat photographs, here's one of Iceland, um, were, were revolutionary for the day even though the res resolution, um, as you could zoom in, 
uh, really wasn't any great, wasn't very great, but it gave it really a, a new tool for looking down at the earth. And often the landslide images were displaying in false color here. Uh, it's not really showing green for grass, that's green for cool temperatures. And you're seeing the red reflecting off of warmer lava fields and uh, not so much off the water, but still lots of information visible here, some national, some cultural. So even the early 20th century satellite images were very useful and they've gotten a lot better. So NASA has a whole archeology span section in which they do all kinds of work, not only looking at the visible spectrum of light, but also going into infrared and ultraviolet either side uh, to see things which you could not see with your naked eye for looking down here. So this is a case study, and I'll let you read that later. Um, this is all posted on the website, on the Blackboard site. Uh, this is looking at roads and linear features from above. So you can see here, these are things which on the ground look like this, not very visible, but from above are very visible indeed. Okay, so satellite imagery really has been transformative in many respects, not just archaeology. Uh, what you're looking at here is a uh, an image, a satellite image, and you can see that there's a boundary line here. That's the boundary between Mexico and Guatemala, and that's being cut right through the forest. So that sharp edge is not natural. This is a result of different forest use legislation on the two sides of, that, of the boundary. This actual photograph from deforestation of the Ten area my country in Mexico was powerful enough that the Mexican government really changed their land use procedures to try to reduce the deforestation rate on their side of the border. Um, and so, of course, these can have consequences. Another example, uh, again, I'll leave you to read this in more detail because you can, is the site of Uber in uh, Oman, in the empty quarter. And this is a caravan center um, where people came from all over. And again, this is early remote sensing, but what you're picking up from this is the linear features, which are the caravan trails, rather than the city itself, which is still here buried. So much more spectacular than some of these pictures are um, space-borne synthetic manned uh, high-resolution radar images um, being broadcast down from space. And this eventually turns into what is called LIDAR laser intensive uh, threshold uh, radar. Uh, Pulses, but even these early uh, synthetic aperture radar images were very interesting. They showed all kinds of things you couldn't see from the ground. So this is from orbital height. What you're seeing here is the Khmer city of Angkor Wat. And this area you see here is what you can visit for the tourists today or when the virus stops. Uh, this is where the impressive temples are, I think you all see photographs. This is a big water tank. This is the artificial lake, which you also knew is there. But then all this stuff radiating out in the landscape here is also part of the city, but people didn't realize quite how big it was. It extended out for miles and miles into the jungle, into modern agricultural areas. Uh, this was a big city, but a very low density one. And this is a, um, definitely a, a discovery which we would not have made without this perspective from, from space. So there's a whole area of Google Earth archaeology, and we've been suggesting you know, go have a look at it. I can give you some links in a minute here. Um, so people rapidly realize that you know Google Earth, especially as the resolution gets better and better, you know you went from very coarse resolution where you could maybe make out as a car there, to the point where you could probably tell what the make of the car was if you zoom in enough. So again, today we have this technology very widespread in most parts of the world. We have very high resolution, so you can really zoom right in there and look for archaeological sites. And here's an example um, from South America, where people have been labeling the site of different parts of this, this excavated structure, set of structures, and you can see again, there we have labels on it. There's lots of resources now posted on Google Earth for archaeology, and we'll make use of this um, later on for the lab. Okay, so there's lots of people are using Google Earth imaging to provide archives for archaeology. Uh, here's an example from uh, classical archaeology in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, if you click on these different sites, you'll get all kinds of information and images. So Google Earth then is, is useful not only for finding sites, but for talking about them, documenting them, and recording them. So again, lots of use from that, that orbital height top down look. So again, here's some useful links. There's some TED Talks there, some stuff from NASA, from Polar Geospatial, people we work with. Really impressive high resolution images. Uh, in some cases, 
getting down to the quality of spy satellites that's full geospatial, um, where under license from them, we can actually see things from space that are about a meter long, which is pretty impressive. Okay, so again, we're thinking about raising site visibility, and we've been looking at this wide area survey issues of remote sensing, multiple spectrum screen sensing, uh, and again, you can see how that really tremendously increases our ability to find sites quickly and to make that information available to your first stage desktop survey. So you can know about this before you go anywhere near the sites in the field. So let's take a look at the site localization survey issues uh, as well. Here we're on our site, we're trying to find more about it, trying to localize the site, get some to learn about it without doing too much damage. And a tool widespread is some kind of a soil core. Uh, this is Oakfield soil core, which we use a lot in Iceland Greenland. And you can see here is the team. Uh, they have put out a tape across the site so they can tell where they are. And they are with main force poking this thing into the earth. And you can see there's archaeology in there. There's charcoal, bits and pieces, <coughs> bones, volcanic tephra. So here's a exercise, sorry, here's a picture showing you uh, a layout for doing a trend site to cross a suspected site using a soil core. Uh, this is ACE graduate student Frank Neely's work. And you can see he's got laid out a tape and she is oriented using compass across this landscape here. Uh, he's got a record book, he's got a folding rule, he's got a soil core and his faithful trowel. So he's gonna poke at regular intervals across here and record what he sees coming up. And here's the map he's just drawn. Again, this is a sketch map, and he's got his labels on the cores, and he's recorded them. And he's also using actually an earlier, fairly primitive version of Google Earth as the resolution. He's got that located, and see each individual one of the coring spots he's got, he can locate on Google Earth. So he's done a really good job of localizing exactly where he took that information. So this is the key between rooting and archaeology. This is really making sure you can locate your contacts. You can connect up the observations you're making by looking at the dirt and the soil core, looking at the archaeology, measuring how deep it is from the surface, getting all the information together, and making sure that you can localize it and that you can store it and access it. Okay, so here's Frank at work again. And in this case, what he's trying to figure out about is what's going on with this depression. You know, this place is called Salunda Cell. And one of the questions is, is, is it a soil a storage pit or is it a charcoal making pit? You can see in this soil core here, and this is the end of the core, he's poked it down, he just sliced it flat with his trowel, and now he's measuring where it is. And look at all that charcoal. You now the gray stuff's charcoal, has some bits and pieces of burnt charcoal, that's a little bit of turf that's been thrown in. Um, and you can see he's doing the depth in which you find Subswell. This is the depth of the archaeology. You can see here you're looking at a pit shape rather than something like sheet and midden, which is really uh, narrow across the area. So Frank has been able to both localize the site and learn some useful things about it you know, in probably about an hour. And you know, this is a, a good thrifty way of getting information. He has poked some holes in the site, they're all about that big. You know, so it's not like he's been doing a whole lot of damage to the site. And it is a way of gathering a lot of information pretty quickly. Um, many teams today use systematic soil coring like this to raise the visibility of sites, um, which are covered by turf or just they're deeply buried, um, and understand more about them before you start doing excavation or do anything else with them. Okay, here's another example of um, answering a question uh, about a site uh, pretty quickly. Um, this is a rather beautiful valley in Iceland. This is Horgadal. And Ramona Harrison, my friend and colleague, was doing her uh, doctoral work on this a few years ago. So we were going to this, sorry, going to this archaeological site over here, this ridge line. And there we go, zooming in on it. So we have a, a fairly obvious archaeological site here, lumps and bumps. And the question is, what are we looking at? Uh, is it a farmhouse or is it, as we suspect, um, a specialized vapor roost, which is, say, a sheep house, which was used uh, exclusively for producing, um, well, for housing sheep, not for anything else. So here's the soil core just outside. And to go through this one, 
this pale stuff you see down here, that's a volcanic tephra, which we know fell about 3,000 years ago. So it's deeply prehistoric, long before anybody got to Iceland. And here's some natural soil formation on top of it. And you can maybe just make out there's another dark line going across here. That's another tephra based about 877 when people first came to Iceland. And on top of that, there's more natural soil formation. And then about here, you get, begin to get um, much later than that initial settlement. You get another tephra running across here. That's the 1300 tephra. You see different colors. And then on top of that, see that greasy stuff you see there? Some gray, greasy stuff. That actually is very well aged sheep poop. And that's what you find on top of it. There's no bits of animal bone. There's no charcoal. Definitely people were there. Their sheep didn't get there on their own. But you can have confirmation that this Bater house was probably was a specialized sheep herding structure, not a farmhouse. And when was it built? Well, after 1300, pretty soon after 1300. See, there's that tephra between date and there's that greasy deposit situated right on top of it. So we know that this was not a structure built in the Viking Age at all. This is late medieval structure. And again, that feeds into our interpretation of what happened in this valley where sheep herding wool production took over uh, and many farms were abandoned and were turned into these sheep houses. So quite a lot you can get out of just a small tube there. Okay, but there's also sometimes a need to dig a bigger hole. And here we are another site, totally slathered. Uh, where we were spending more time. Our mission here was to learn as much as we possibly could about the site uh, without actually excavating it. So after doing a whole series of corings, we decided to open up a small test pit outside the area. We thought we were going to find our uh, structures, but to sort of get a sense of what the deposits were like. So this is zooming in on a fairly fast and dirty test pit, but you can see the stratigraphy taking place here. Down here in the bottom, this double black layer here, is the first tephra, the 877 tephra, Viking Age tephra. And directly on top of it, there's bits and pieces of turf, there's animal bone coming up. So one thing we've learned from here, this is a Viking Age site. This goes all the way back to that period, so it's quite old, and it continues up uh, into the Middle Ages. And there's a, a close-up, we can probably see that's the subsoil, pre-human soil, and then there's the, the double tephra, and then here's the stratified <coughs> archaeology going up. Okay, are these spaceships? No, they're black flies. Now, this is the problem of taking photographs in Iceland summertime in this area. Uh, boy, they have flies. Okay, so <coughs> one of the things to think about as we are, we're working on our survey, and we're moving from wide-scale site survey to much more focused, site-focused investigations, the question is how much can you learn from a site um, by doing progressively more intrusive investigations. You saw it thoroughly saw there that, you know, a single hole can actually teach you quite a lot. But the question then is, how many holes would you dig before you start destroying the site? So the question then is time, money, damage, information. How are you learning versus what damage you're doing? So the big question, of course, is what are your objectives? You know, is this a survey where you're trying to learn about a whole range of different sites to perhaps investigate some, not investigate others? It is a heritage management project. We're just trying to get equal amounts of information from different sites. How much time do you spend per site? You know, that's a big question. You know, is your intent to, multiple, to visit 10 or 15 different sites in the course of one season? Or are you really going to focus on one or two sites with the idea of trying to choose something for labor excavations? So again, it comes into detail versus coverage. It also gets you a question about whether this is a standalone survey project, survey and you're done, or the part of a phase project with the intent is to end up with an excavation. So that really gets you into this question of how invasive to get. Um, what's the, advantage, the balance between information and damage? And again, being able to record the context, that's the key. Okay, so we have some questions then <coughs> about using metal detectors. And metal detectors have sort of a mixed reputation in archaeology, um, in part because they're really popular in many parts of the world with, with amateurs, with applicational folks. Um, and sometimes those guys and gals, mostly guys, uh, can wind up doing some real damage to the archaeology. Okay, on this side, we have a bunch of jolly folks from England. It must be Christmas time because they're all dressed up like Santa Claus. And they have a bunch of, of you know, basically Radio Shack grade metal detectors. And they've been back and forth across this field. And they got some stuff. They have some, 
some coins. And I think the key thing that got here is a Bronze Age brooch. Cool. So these guys are walking a wide area. They're picking a bunch of stuff. Basic question is, how good are they about locating where they found it? And what do they do with the stuff once they get it? Now, the right answer is they're GPSing in their finds and they're keeping track of where they came from and they're giving them, or at least giving photos of them, to the local archaeological association. That's the right answer. So you have lots of work by metal detectors, which actually turns out to be very archaeology positive. It's really transformed Viking Age archaeology in Denmark and South Sweden um, because there was this very strong collaboration between metal detectors um, and uh, professional archaeologists worked out really well. Other parts of the world, such as the United States, not so good. Uh, most people are winding up putting these things in cigar boxes, forgetting about them. They don't remember where they came from. So it's basically information loss. Okay, then we've got this guy. Uh, he's a lot more, more professional looking guy. He's got a really better metal detector, which can go much deeper. And that could be good, except you notice he's also carrying a spade, which means he's going to make a hole. If he gets a positive return on something, he's going to dig a hole and then get it. And that's usually very destructive for the archaeology. So metal detectors then have, have real archaeological applications, but there's also some issues with them. Let's take a look at a positive case. In 2014, the biggest Saxon coin horn found in years in Britain, there it is, was located in the English countryside by this gentleman Welsh, I'm sure archaeologist Peter Welsh, uh, who used Google Earth images to localize um, a find and then found it using uh, metal detectors. So what you're seeing here is, he was seeing what we we're seeing. There's ridge and furrow agriculture. Look at that. Yep, yep. Remember that you saw that's from Scotland? Here's a rectangular enclosure, which is turns out to be a Anglo-Saxon manor house. Uh, but notice here, there's in the middle of this field, there are these trees planted right there. They're big, they're old. What's going on there? Well, he knew, Welsh knew, that actually one of the things that you can see sometimes when they do that, when they plant trees in the middle of the field, is to prevent other farmers from breaking their plows uh, because there's a big rock there. And that's where you don't want to bring your plow through this. They plant a tree essentially to set that off as, you know, don't plow here. So we knew that also, that also tended to be associated with past archaeology was buried. And sure enough, it was. Now, the good thing about this is it's a happy ending because this guy was very responsible and his, his team was very responsible. They documented everything he did and they, they turned in the gold, the uh, silver. And they made some money because in Britain, this is treasure trove and the government will, will pay for it. So it's again a happy story here. Uh, they're using the interpretation of Google Earth Air photos combined with metal detectors to make a spectacular find and be able to locate where it came from. So a happy ending for this one. Okay, so again, there's lots more you can do beyond Google. I'll let you look at this one later, click on some of the resources, but there's lots of material that you can use on this online to, to do really interesting armchair archaeology uh, using Google Earth. Okay, so let's take a look at what you learn about a site by doing surface collection and how you then go from there. Uh, this is a pretty basic but, but useful map uh, of where you find things. So this is, as you see, the same area that they've walked over and it's been gridded and it's somebody's field. So what they've done there is they've put up different colors for the frequency of different pieces of potsherds, different pots found. So again, this is looking at the hot spots. This is where you get lots of them, down here, not so many. And this is looking at daub. <coughs> daub is material that you put on the, the side of your house uh, to keep it waterproof, it's just mud. But if the house burns, it is fired and it's like pottery. You notice that there's concentration of pottery here, but not so much daub. The daub is a little different. The daub may be associated with architecture. The pottery may be things that's associated with dump outside. So by looking at the patterns here and getting a sense of what's going on there, you sort of get an idea of, okay, if I'm going to excavate this site and I'm looking interested in you know, recovering a lot of pottery from a dump, that might be there maybe over here. If I'm interested in some architecture, maybe I should open up over here. So again, this is just keeping track of where things are being found, but it's showing you how just a simple map can help you plan the project and get a sense of what you can do next.
Another method, again, pioneered in Scandinavia, especially in Sweden, uh, is used to swell phosphate analysis to find stuff. Phosphates are deposited in the ground by all sorts of things, but garbage and poop are two big ones. So if you're looking for class concentrations of human activity, animal activity, uh, finding concentrations of phosphate in the ground is a good way of doing that. So you can see here, sorry, you can see here on the Swedish landscape, the darker the color, the more phosphates. You can see they've done transects out across here and taken lots of phosphate measurements. And you can see some areas got not much going on. Other areas just seems like a highly focused point there. And this is just saturated over here and over there. So big question about this is what are we looking at and where would we excavate more? This might be a little village site right there. This may be an area which has been systematically fertilized for a long time. Um, that may be a cultural area still. So you have then a bunch of things you can get from soil phosphate analysis. Um, enough work has been done in much of South Scandinavia that people really can use these to map past archaeological settlements in quite a lot of detail. So soil phosphate, your friend. And then again, we looked at a bit of this earlier, but this is looking at buried features and magnetic anomalies. Buried features like pits and walls, hearths, don't just affect the vegetation on top of them, it's with crop marking. They also leave a permanent signature uh, in the magnetic susceptibility of the ground. Um, simply, the area that's been disturbed by a pit will conduct electricity a whole lot better than the wall. So what you're doing is you're doing a soil resistivity measurement, and here's a guy doing it the, the hard old-fashioned way, um, walking along, sticking these probes in the ground. And this is what's happening. As he's putting these probes in the ground, they're radiating electricity through the ground and to fixed points here. The data logger is keeping track of where things are, areas of high and low resistivity, and ends up kind of looking like this. Again, the dark bits are high resistivity, so this is the rocks, and lighter bits are not so much. So you can see coming out of this, this sort of city, uh, survey on top of this existing ruined um, monastery in Britain, you can see a lot of features are popping out. And again, you can cover a wide area uh, with not a lot of time. Now, modern versions of soil resistivity meters can actually be done um, from the back of a, um, a light vehicle, so you can go even faster. So there's been a lot of refinement taking place on this. Magnetometer work, again, is making some of the same principles of soil resistivity, but this is using a magnetometer that is essentially a silica mine detector. Uh, it allows you to see, again, below the soil. It is somewhat faster than soil resistivity. You don't need the probes. Uh, it is highly affected by things like buried lines of you know, electricity or something. So you can't really use an urban environment, but it works quite well on the countryside. And again, these things can be automated, and you can put them on the backs of ATVs and things like that. And people have done some remarkable things with them. And then the ground penetrating radar. That's what it sounds like, is you're actually dragging radar emitters over the current surface. And that's what you see these guys doing here. And this has the advantage that you can sort of set it for depth. So you can get a, a different image at different depths down. Now, ground penetrating radar um, can be very impressive in what you can do, but it tends to be cumbersome to, to do on the ground. And you can see that these guys are working pretty hard. And you also need to have clear ground surface. So it's not going to work in places with lots of trees and things like this. But that said, where it can be done, it can produce really useful images, again, without breaking soil surface. So non-invasive and learning lots. So putting these together is, of course, as usual, the best way of doing it. Uh, this is looking at a, uh, a modern town in Austria that has a Roman town under it. And one of the questions that they're trying to answer is, is you know, where is the Roman town? If we're going to expand the Audubon, when are we going to hit? Um, we have to pay for the archaeology. If we move the Autobahn, we miss the archaeology. So this is, again, uh, as you can see, they're using their ground penetrating radar, uh, and they're doing their slices of different depths. And this is showing the pattern in coming out at these different depths. So here's the existing Autobahn that's going right to the middle. Uh, you can see these rectilinear patterns coming out. This is the Roman town laid out on a grid system. If you lay out, layer onto this the magnetic prospection, again, this is the the magnetometer survey, uh, you're again seeing another layer of information is coming up here. And then if you put it together with magnetic and GPR, you begin to get uh, a real interpretation, which you're seeing there. So again, this is an example 
of putting it all together. You know, multiple different kinds of sensors working together. And I think you can see that you're gathering information here, um, which would be really hard to get through excavation of anything less than, you know, hundreds of acres of town, which you could not afford. So answers a lot of useful questions. LIDAR survey has become tremendously popular in archaeology because it uses laser uh, imagery, uh, either from, um, well, can be done from drones, it's more usually these days done from aircraft, from satellites. And the advantage of this is it allows you to essentially see through vegetation and visually strip off those, those images. So here you're looking at here, it's a LIDAR survey of a forested area and it's false color, but that's what you see at one layer, that's the top of the forest. If you strip off the forest, you can see beneath it these cool archaeological features. So you have the ability then, without destroying any landscapes, to actually get down through all that vegetation, see things otherwise you would not see. And this can be applied at sea as well. Uh, side scan sonar is essentially the same technology, but using sound images, but it can be enhanced to really high precision. So you're looking at here is a 19th century sailing ship, looks like this, that is settled in the bottom, and you can see it's still more or less intact under the waters of the icy uh, waters of the Arctic. This is an exploring ship stuck fast in ice, uh, sank around 1848, and it tells us, um, again, they found it. So the Canadians found this just a few years ago, and they, these are two lost ships, um, which have finally been found with archaeology. You can see they can document at high resolution. Again, with side scanning sonar, here is a Russian submarine uh, lost in World War II. And again, you can see very high resolution. And here again is the Swedish 20th century wreck. And if you zoom in on these, I mean, look at the amount of detail you're seeing here from the railing. Uh, this is at uh, almost 500 meters in depth. It's really difficult to get the divers, um, but the images taken with the robot uh, can allow you to get the, this kind of detail coming out of it. And again, you can measure it. So lots of useful sites to look at with that. Okay, I think that's about it uh, for me. I will stop sharing. And I need to turn over to Francisco. Joe Boo. I will make him a co-host. Hi, Francisco. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're all unmuted. Yep. Okay, well, that's it for me. I will turn over to Francisco, and he will uh, he'll guide you, and we will keep doing this. I'm going to stop recording now, so we don't have...